Hello, my name is Justin Lehman, Prairie State Genetics, PSGX World. Um, I'm a fifth generation farmer from the Midwest. It would be kind of hard for me to sum up all my lifetime stories through prison and living on the streets, heroin addict, cannabis business. It'd be kind of hard to sum up all that. So I'll just kind of take it back a little bit to the origin of where I'm from. Um, I'm from Peoria, Illinois, where Richard Pryor's from. My dad, <laughs> my dad was a biker. Um, he was a truck driver. He used to grow weed back in the 80s, and he worked the truck, so he was in and out of Canada. So he moved a lot of dope back in the 80s. Um, I grew up with the man. Um, he taught me about the plant. I've been around the cannabis plant my whole life since I was a little kid. I mean, he was growing Mexican sativa and taking plants out in cornfields and all that in like 1985, 1986. That's my daughter back there right now. She's 13 years old. She's been around the plant her whole life. She was born in 2010 during the medical boom of Denver, Colorado. So I was selling clones. As a matter of fact, this, the way the story goes is I was handing a guy a tray of clones for $1,500 and my ex-wife, she tapped on the window and I said, what? She said, come on, we gotta go. I said, what? She said, my water broke. So I walked up to the guy, handed him clones, got the $1,500 and we went to the hospital and had her. So <laughs> she's been around the plant her whole life and she's the one over there selling clones too. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll take it back to there then. Um, my dad, growing up in Illinois, I was in and out of juvenile prison. Um, I was in and out of foster care up in Chicago. I was pretty much red. I mean, some of the first faces I remember was black faces in my life from being in and out of foster care. I lived kind of a strange life. I was a Midwest white trash kid that was in and out of the system, getting pulled in and out. So I grew up kind of rough. I grew up with some, some monsters, some really smart, talented, athletic dudes that are ghosts now. You know, they're not here no more. They're either in prison or they're not around no more. So I, I went to juvenile prison. I maxed out at 18. They let me out. Within a year later, I was back in prison. I turned 21 in prison, like the song. I turned 21 in prison, doing life without parole. I turned 21 in prison. I got out. I tried to get into the military down in Arkansas. I took my meps, my ASVAPs. I, went, I swore into the red carpet room. I got my military assignment for gun repair. And on the way home, in the vehicle, the recruiter got a call. He's like, you ever been to Peking, Illinois? And I was like, yeah, I have been. He's like, well, you got a domestic battery out of there. And in the military to us, that's a felony, even though it's a misdemeanor on the streets. So they barred me for a year. And this was in 2005. So I didn't really have much going on. I had kicked heroin at that time, staying down with my dad, trying to get into the military. And so I didn't know what else to do. So I got on the computer. I bought a bunch of concert tickets to a festival in California, Quincy, California, with a long time ago, somebody's credit card or whatever. And um, I hitchhiked across the country to go get those tickets. So I'll take you to the hitchhiking story now. So 2005, my dad dropped me off. It's kind of an emotional story for me, but um, he dropped me off from Piggott, Arkansas on the side of the road. And the last song that was playing was uh, Janis Joplin, me and Bobby McGee. And I'll never forget what it said. Freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. So I started hitchhiking. My first ride that picked me up, Poplar Bluff, Missouri, as crazy as it sounds, was a military recruiter, an army recruiter that I had been dealing with, I swear. They were going on vacation with their family up to Herculaneum, Missouri. And he's like, he's like, what are you doing, man? I was like, Sometimes you're going to the military. I was like, no, they, they barred me because this and that. He said, oh, well, we're going about an hour north, hour and a half. If you want to ride, hop in the bed of the truck. So I had a beer, a cigarette. I laid in the bed of the truck. They put the tarp down, drove me to Herculaneum, Missouri, and dropped me off on the side of the road. So that was my first ride hitchhiking. I got to California in three and a half days on 11 rides with $50 in my pocket and two bags of clothes. Everybody in my life to this day, from my daughter to Guru Su to my buddy Chad to Big Boy, everybody, Claude, everybody that's in my life, man, has been manifested from, from this journey that I went on. Always in the back of my mind, I knew what I wanted to do, growing cannabis. I was a kid that was in my basement reading the High Times magazine, and that's what I wanted to do. So I knew I was going to California to do that. So that was my first ride. My second ride was a young dude that was a uh, 
he was a real estate kid. He picked me up, he smoked a couple joints with me. He dropped me off. Some of my rides, the hardest time was getting out of St. Louis. I had to get up to St. Louis and then get across. So I'll skip a few rides in there. But on my way going out of St. Louis, there was a girl that picked me up. It was getting nighttime. Sun was setting. I had no idea what the fuck I was going to do. I wasn't even getting worried yet. But some girl pulled up in a white Navigator. Pulls up, white SUV. And she's like, hey, you need a ride? I was like, yeah. I jumped in. She's like, I'm going seven minutes up the road. Ended up, we talked and started smoking weed, eating mushrooms. Went skinny dipping in a Merrimack Cavern Lake. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed the night with her in Motel in California, Missouri, at the Motel California. And uh, we hung out together all night. And then in the morning, she dropped me off in Kansas City, Missouri. So I'm on the side of the road in Kansas City, Missouri now, holding a sign that says Denver, Colorado. Because that was my next point I was trying to get to, Kansas City, Denver. So I get picked up by a truck driver. He picks me up. He hunting game, looking out the window for stuff. He drops me off in Denver, Colorado. All right, so I end up in Thornton, Colorado that night, sleeping under an underpass, two bags of clothes, hardly no money, not really knowing what's going on. I got a couple more rides up north into Wyoming. Had another guy drop me off in Ogden, Utah. He was a guy that, uh, he was a teacher, a really nice man. He had a room, two beds. I stayed in there with him for the night. And uh, in the morning, he dropped me off in the Salt Lake Flats. So I was outside the Salt Lake, all white. And my very last ride was a Hispanic dude. He didn't speak hardly no English. He just pulled up, said, throw your stuff in the back. He had a brand new map. We jumped in. And he drove me all the way from Salt Lake City all the way to Truckee, California. So when we got to Truckee, California, we went to a bar, drank a couple cervezas. I got drunk. He left. I passed out at the train station in Truckee, California, across the street. And um, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I heard fucking reggae music. I woke up, what the fuck, dark, I walk across the street to the bar, started meeting people, I moved in with Stan Charles from the Chucky tribe, his dad's Pete, I lived with him for a while, and um, that's pretty much my hitchhiking story, and how I got out to California, right there, um, I ended up getting to the concert, I got the tickets, I scalped them, I stayed there for four days at High Sierra Music Festival, Keller Williams was playing there, got a bunch of mushrooms, weed, sold it. I went back to Tahoe, and I lived there for months. I moved up into the mountains, and in 2005, I started growing cannabis indoor. So that's really where I started with Sorendar on Donner Pass Road in Northern California, right outside Truckee. I started growing, what was it? We was growing the cough in Northern Lights Number 5. But I'd always grown the plant outdoor with my dad, but this was the first time I learned how to grow indoor. So I started growing indoor with him. And um, fast forward a little bit, I ended up in prison. 2008, they let me out. But I ended up having to go to prison. The honest to the truth is, I mean, I, I never even really told too many people this, but I was a junkie living on the streets in Denver. I was homeless, sleeping under a bridge with bums and raccoons and shooting heroin in my arm and coke. And uh, they threw me in prison. I tried to take a lady's purse. I was so strung out. She grabbed me. She wrapped her hands up in my hair. I couldn't get away from her. She had me. A guy from the Cheesecake Factory came out, tackled me down to the ground. I shit myself. I remember the cops telling me how bad I stank and shit. So I had to go back to prison. I got out in 2008 in Denver, Colorado. Now listen, they, they let me out on a reconsideration. So I was supposed to have seven years in prison. I spent a year and a half, and they called me back nowhere for a reconsideration. I didn't even know what that was. I went back for the reconsideration, and they let me out. I, had, I couldn't believe it. I wrote this little opus to the court of comparing my addiction to a labyrinth and a minotaur and some, you know, Greek stories. And they let me out and said, Mr. Lehman, not only does this opus to the court show your intelligence and desire to change, but we're going to let you out today. I said, today? And they said, yeah. So they let me out January 19th, 2008 to the exact same situation I went in before. But this time I wasn't homeless or nothing. I seen the same homeless dudes playing guitar, like the same, the same spot. In my mind, I wanted to go back to doing dope. I wanted to run from it all, but I didn't. I went to the homeless shelter. I sat in the kitchen. And what I seen on TV that night, I seen BJ Penn win the 155 lightweight championship. He elbowed this dude and opened up his head. 
uh, Joe Stevenson. It was that fight. That was the night I got out of prison. BJ Penn's like four or five years older than me, and that, that kind of inspired me. I remember I didn't have nothing. So here I am in the bum shelter now, 2008. I'm out of prison. I'm watching this fight. We used to be able to go up and upstairs and use the computer. So I went up there and talked to women, you know. And I'm a young man in this world, you know, at that time. Of, and I met her mother on the computer. And we, um, you know, we were young. We had a good relationship. I did, I did drugs then too. But I started growing bud in Denver, Colorado now. So this is the medical boom of 2008. Back then they had this huge medical boom in Colorado where a bunch of people submitted all their medical apps. It was just a huge flux of it. It was a really amazing time to be around. Like Scott from Rare Dankness out there, he was around during that time. I mean, many dudes came out of that generation. True story, 2009, I made $100,000 off of Craigslist selling clones. My ex-wife can verify it. That's what kind of gave me the taste of this business, understanding, like, man, I can make some fucking money at this, you know? Like, she was born, you know, 2010 came around. The law changed in Denver in uh, 2012. We used to, be able to, used to be able to stack patients. You could put, go to the notary and get your, you should stack 99 of them together. And for each one, you got six plants. So we were able to put that on our grow room and we could grow that many plants. So they changed the law in Denver. So me and her and her mom, we packed up. I took two pounds of weed and I put Glock 9 and we drove to uh, Arkansas to live with my dad. My dad, my dad's redneck, hillbilly, beer drinking, gun shooting, wild man, that I could only get along with for about a week at a time, you know. He passed away years ago. But uh, we went down there. He got a chance to see her. And um, it just didn't work out down there. So we had to move 2012 now. We had to go all the way from Arkansas and drive across the country now with a baby, wife, all that, to her parents' house in Canoga Park. Got in the business out there in California, cannabis business. But this whole time, and I'm telling you this, like I've been a drug addict on and off the whole time, a heroin addict. And even that kid back there, man, she's seen a lot of stuff that, you know, to this day, she raised herself, really. You know, she raised two kids to give her the respect that she needs. That's why she seems so grown for her age, truthfully. And um, so we're in Canoga Park. I got to the cannabis game out there. That's where I met Swerve from the Cali Connection. I met a lot of guys out there. Got into the weed business. And I got to be truthful with you guys. From 2013 until 2019, I can't really talk too much about it. Because <clears throat> there were some pretty rough times in there. I spent time in Skid Row. I kind of lost track of time in many ways. Schizophrenic on the streets, doing drugs. I'll fast forward a little bit though. 2019 comes around and we, you know, all together end up in Carson City, Nevada. She moved in with her mom. They're doing their own thing, you know. I'm out doing drugs in Reno. I'm homeless in a stolen truck, shooting heroin, robbing people, just doing a lot of horrible things. I didn't know what else to do, so I went to rehab. November 22nd, 2019, and I made a decision to get clean. That's where I met Sue at. She was my nurse in there. That's my guru right there, Guru Sue. This lady, in my entire life, I've never had anyone take care of me like her. But uh, yeah, she was my yoga teacher in there. And she's my handler today, to this day. Look, I'm not really much. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for people like them. I mean, I've been a scumbag most of my life. I don't got no education. I, I got a GED in juvenile prison. Um... I'm very grateful to her. So I've stayed clean off heroin ever since then. I got over four years clean now. And um, right. thank you. I appreciate that. I feel like I got to take you back to one more thing, though. Before I went to rehab, I got in a really bad accident. 
in Reno, Nevada. It was three weeks before I went to rehab in 2019. It wasn't even my fault. I mean, I was high. I was shooting heroin and speed. But it was nighttime. I was coming back from Reno on the spaghetti bowl. And some, I was pulling off the side of the road. And some dude fucking fell asleep and hit me. Flipped my Montero over. Smashed me into a fucking wall. And I was trapped in the vehicle. Oh, wow. Honest to goodness. Yeah, I was trapped in the vehicle. And um, I heard this voice. And I thought about it. Because I flipped me upside down. And when you're upside down... You go to grab for your seatbelts on the wrong side and shit, like, and all my stuff was smashed. I was trapped in the vehicle. I got scars on my hands and shit from it. Um, and the dude come up to the window, you know, it's dark, it was nighttime, it's midnight. It's actually on my fucking birthday, too. October 30th of 2019. It was on my birthday, as soon as it struck fucking midnight. How old were you? What's that? How old were you? Oh, well, that would have been fucking, what was that, five years ago? So, 37, something like that. 37. So I'm trapped in the fucking vehicle upside down, you know. What's crazy, my dad worked for Mitsubishi when I was a kid, so I almost died at fucking Mitsubishi Montero. <laughs> so I'm upside down in the vehicle. The dude that hit me, he's tapping on the window. He's like, hey, man, are you all right? I was like, hey, man, bust open this window and get me out of here. And he's all stumbling out there. And I'm like, oh, man, he ain't going to do shit for me. I heard a voice. <laughs> He said, boy, get out of there. And that's what I did. I got out of there. I cut my hands up real bad. I crawled out the fucking little triangle. And that dude was standing there. He said, hey, man, what? I'm gonna I grew up real rough. You know, I didn't do nothing to him. But he said, hey, man, why were you slowing down? I said, why the fuck did you rear in me? About the time we got to the side of the road to sit down on the little thing, you know, two more cars flew in. <laughs> fucking hit the vehicle. <laughs> hit the vehicle. One dude died. The last dude to hit it, he was a painter, some contractor painter dude. He died. He was on the spaghetti bowl in Reno. I couldn't believe it when it happened. It was like a fucking... I couldn't believe it. Cop showed up. I'm really going to say too much about that, but... Cop showed up. I ended up getting to leave. I didn't go to the hospital. The tow truck gave me a ride to the casino. And then I got a ride to go home, but... I didn't have a fucking, I didn't have a scratch on me from it. I had a little rip in my coat. It flipped me upside down. But I died in there. A piece of me died in there, is what I mean. I remember looking back in the wreck and seeing the face in there. That was my old self. That's why I, I, I'm into that, you know, back from the dead and all that post on Instagram and all that sort of stuff. And on the Abe Lincoln, I put the dead under his eye and stuff because I did die in that crash. I changed my life. I went through a metamorphosis at that point. So I got out. I looked for that kid, too, that rear-ended me. I was going to do something to him. I swear I could have. I'm that type. I used to be that type of dude. I was going to find him. I knew where he lived. I knew everything about him. And I was going to, too. But then I started thinking about it. And you know what? He did me a favor. You know? He changed my life. He helped me. Yeah. It helped me, man. Like, it changed my life, so... From that moment forward, I went to rehab, you know, taking it back to where I met Sue. And um, 2020 hits, all right? I'm clean. You know, I got what? November, December. Corona hits 2020. It's crazy. Illinois, my home state where I'm from, Richard Pryor, Peoria, fifth most populated state in the United States, borders six other states. It's the California, the Midwest, goes legal. And all these people are hitting me up fucking for seeds. We made... Lots of money in two or three years out of Illinois and the Midwest. And it started there. It started there in 2020. And the first seeds I really started putting out was old seeds from the old box. I still had a box of seeds in our storage unit from the years before that I had been breeding and everything. So that's where it started off 2020. Getting seeds to people, all Illinois people, nobody else. By 2021, I went back to Illinois for the first time in 17 years on foot and did a travel and seedsman tour. I hit every hydroponic shop in the state of Illinois with a couple of my buddies, taking seeds, prairie state genetic seeds to each one. Some of them would buy $1,000 worth. and That's really how we got this off the ground. I mean, I don't know how much more organic it can get really than that. We did it on foot in a shitty hippie van that fucking barely ran with my buddy Big Jim. Shout out Big Jim. He's mad at me, but shit happens, fool. Like, so 2021, 
We did the traveling seedsman tour. I stayed in Illinois grinding it out. I mean, if you really want to know the truth, we opened up the Midwest. And we opened it up with Farm Bill 2018. It's clear. You can read the Farm Bill. There is no distinction. All these plants, it's one plant. This plant that we're all in here for, this bond of a plant that we all love and we're celebrating, it's one plant. Just like we're one son of man. It's one plant. We're not talking about a bunch of different plants. We're talking about one plant in different phases of evolutionary timing. So when they write these laws, they're thinking about money and trouble and crime. They're not thinking about the genetic status of the plant. That's where all this hinges up and lies at, is the genetics behind it. Okay, so Farm Bill 2018 says, Anything under 0.3. Okay, hemp. If you got a clone and you got seeds, there's no THC. There's no THC in that clone. You have to flower it to get THC. There's no THC in that seed. Those are technically still hemp. That's what I drilled in. I've been on the ground with fucking guns in my head. We've had spots raided. I've had hundreds of fucking plants taken out. You can ask all these people. I grew up in Illinois. True stories. But I've always known one thing. Farm Bill 2018. And I've stuck to it. I knew that this plant is hemp. It's what the people fought for in Seattle years ago with the hemp fest. I don't know where we got away from it in time of separating all this, but it's one plant. And clones, I say this to everyone, as long as they're not in flower and they're in veg, they can't do nothing about that. Same thing with seeds. We had seeds on the airplane. Did we not? Big bag. Big bag of seeds on the airplane. I mean, I've been upset with people, you know, Emerald Cup people and all these people over time about these events because I see a lot of stuff that's going on within the culture. And I'll speak a little bit on culture now. This is the best event in the country. We've done all of them. I mean, pretty much, have we not? We've been all over the country. This is the best event in the country. It's a family event. This is a true bond experience of an event. All the other ones, I'm not talking bad. They're all beautiful and fun in their own way. But this event is really special to us. We came last year. Swerve and Pakalolo invited us out here. And uh, this is our second year here. My life just seems like a bunch of flashes. You know, I mean, here I am with my daughter in Hawaii and my handler, Sue, and some of my best friends. We got money now. We can travel. It's like, (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes it don't feel real. But I'm happy. I don't have no bad days no more, man. I really don't. I was sleeping in Denver under fuck. I've really done it. Like, no bullshit. Not like people talk about it. Like, I've really been with six hundred, six other bums under a tarp, under a fucking bridge, trying to stay fucking warm with raccoons crawling around eating the scraps and shit. I've really broken into cheesecake factories just to stay warm. I've really scrapped copper, crawled in basements, and I've really hurt people, too. I'm not proud of it. It's still in my dreams, you know? But the plant, the plant's the one thing that's always been there for me, man. Most everybody else is, you know, I'm not saying Sue or my daughter, most everyone else has given up on me in my life at one point, you know? How could you not, you know, to someone like that? But the plant's always been there for me. And I've been grateful. I've always believed in the plant. I've always kept the same mantra the whole time that the plane is a bond. The Mesopotamians had a word, it's called Durenki in Sumeria. Mesopotamian, Assyriology. And the Durenki is the bond. It's the connection between the heaven and the earth. It's the cord between the two. And that's what this plane has been for me my whole life. So, I'm not really sure how I'm doing on time right now. I talk kind of fast. I'm good. How much time do I have left? Okay. So, I mean, here's one thing I got to say about Hawaii. And I hope some of you guys can take this back to these other people. I understand there's people here helping writing bills and all these laws. And, dude, stop trying to box yourself in. The world is changing. They're getting ready to reschedule to Schedule 3. When they reschedule to Schedule 3, the feds, that's going to open up many, many doors for financial aspects that people can't see. Especially people out here because they don't understand the rec market. Look, the rec's not perfect. There's no perfect market in the United States. But they're all not fucking doing shit either. So whoever said that, don't believe that. There's no perfect rec market. But it's the next natural progression in the cycle of getting where you need to be. 
Of course these politicians are going to make money, and they're scumbags. We all know that. But they hold the ball, you know? They hold the ball. Wreck is the, na the natural progression. At that point, when wreck goes, and the Schedule 3 happens, then everything opens up. But I thought I would come up here with all the answers. I don't have fucking none of the answers. <laughs> But I had experiences. And I, I kind of thought to myself, too, what would happen to Hawaii? Because, you know, how you guys had no dispensaries, black market for a long period of time. Well, what would happen if Hawaii didn't go wreck this time and it did reschedule Schedule 3? I mean, I think a lot of people don't really see, but Hawaii is already in a black market right now. It's just there's so much fear, people can't see it. It's already a black market, really. What's that? Yeah. You know what? And I understand everyone's got their different agendas and what they want to pitch and they want their own co-ops and all this and that, but it don't matter what, what, what we really want individually. It matters what we need collectively. So we need to let a lot of people with agendas to the wayside go. A lot of these promoters and people that are putting events together and these guys that are dragging people across the country from one place to somewhere else for their middlemen. It's crushing and it's killing our culture. Holding people back ostracizing people, not liking people personally. Dude, fuck all that. This is a plant that bonds all of us and unites us. Everybody needs an opportunity. It's, we're tired of the same people doing the same thing. That's how we got the same results over and over again. We need new blood. We need new faces. We need new heroes. We need new stars. We need people that are fearless. I'm not worried about no helicopters or no fucking cops or none of that. That's how we successfully did this financially. I've never given a fuck about any of that. I've never counted plants. I've always been ready for whatever happened. Well, I figured we would deal with it. And I have. We had a spot in Illinois. Get raided. I've not even told too many people about this with my piece of shit brother. Versace. Yeah, we came in. They took fucking hundreds of plants from us. Had us on the ground. Gunpoint. No charges. You know what they do, though? They steal your lights. And they steal your plants. And why do they do that? Because they want to slow it down. Because they can't stop it. So you're telling me right now that cops are stealing people's weed and lights? For what reason? So dispensaries can make fucking money? Not really. So politicians? Dude, the whole system is off. <laughs> Look, this is a plant we're talking about. It's not a fucking crime. This is a plant that saves lives. It's medicine. I mean, everyone in here knows somebody that has benefited from this plant in one way or another. All this money we put behind it. Here, here's one thing we don't need. I, I kind of, I don't mean to... Wreck is the next natural progression. But we really don't need any more laws. No more boxing ourselves in with certain spaces to grow in and confinements. Dude, we just need people that are fearless, really. And we need people that understand this is one plant. It's just in different evolutionary phases of time. So, we come over here to Hawaii. I'm very thankful to come over here. Um, I got buddies. My buddy Chad right there. His buddy Squatch. They took good care of us coming over here. And my security. I talk a lot of shit, so I might need security once in a while. You know? <laughs> yeah, but we had a good time. I do talk a lot of shit online. I talk a shit on Instagram. Um, I let these people know. And why do I do it? Because they're all bullshit. Look, I don't never just go after somebody I don't like to try to maliciously. I go after the people that need it. There's a Jethro Tull song. He polarized the pumpkin eaters, the minstrel in the gallery. He polarized the pumpkin eaters. And I feel sometimes that's what I'm doing. I feel it's my job. I've lived all these different lives. I fucking OD'd on heroin four times and quantum leaped into a fucking hospital. I mean... I'm not afraid of none of these people. I'm not, and I just really would like to help change this plant. We need some sort of a revolution about it. We don't need people fucking speaking business laws and writing fucking, we don't need none of that. What we need is all of us to come together. But um, that's pretty much where I'm at right there. Anybody got questions? Kids, just the one. Yeah, my Are one daughter. Done? Are you done? Am I done? I can still have them. If I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you want to? Are you wanting to? Man, I don't know, dude. My life's been so crazy. Like, 
I'm happy with her, you know. I'm, I'm content with that. You know, I mean, I guess I could go off like Alexander the Great and, you know, start populating, but I think this world we're living in now, that's another thing, too, man. We need to get the... What's that? Oh, she's a good woman. She owns a, a dog grooming shop now. She's doing really well. Yeah, she's got herself something going on in life and very happy, you know. I got a lot of respect for her now. You know, I got to give her props, too. I appreciate you saying that. That was a woman that hung with me through a lot of shit. You know, drugs time and time again, like jail coming in and out. It never worked out for us, but, you know, we were young kids and we learned a lot from it. And I'm very grateful, you know, to have a daughter. I like to call her medical boom baby because she was born in the medical boom. <laughs> yeah. So, Justin, what's, what's next for you? Man, dude, you know, where we're at right now, I'm... I can't stop, dude. I'm really one of those dudes. I can't stop, to be honest. I don't tell many people that. But in my mind, we're going to be the top. We're going to... We'll go down legendary in this business, humbly. And it won't just be for clout or because I'm cool. It'll be for changing things. That's what it'll be for. It'll be for changing things within this culture. We sell seeds. I breed plants. I haven't really got into that much. But I've been working, breeding plants... All through those troubles that I had during those times, it's one thing that's been with me. has been the plant. is working it, breeding it. I um, I started getting serious, though, breeding it. Matter of fact, Swerve taught me how to fucking reverse plants in 2013 from the Cali Connection. He was the first dude that taught me how to reverse plants. But 2019 to 2020 is when we really started taking it serious with the genetics. I think, I mean, a lot of people will tell you, but I stick to the old school codes with the breeding. What does reverse Reversing it. So it's when you take a plant, you spray it with a colloidal silver, and you're going to force it to show male flower. So you're going to use that pollen to put on another plant to make your feminized seeds. So you reverse I it. That you only want female. What's that? Is it the stuff you smoke and the stuff you grow female? Yeah, it's a feminine energy, the what we smoke, but you know there is a male part of it as but well. We I heard that you're supposed to destroy all the male plants. Nah, I mean, it depends what your purpose is. You know what I mean? If you want to, if you're trying to do some breeding, you want to keep your males around. But if you're just growing for bud and your own smoke, yeah, you want to get rid of the males. I see. But if you're feminizing plants, yeah, you want to take your, your target and you want to reverse her and get that pollen and put it on something else. But I've been, I've been working with plants for a long time. I feel like I have a, an understanding for the breeding that's a little bit clearer than a lot of other breeders. I'm not sure if it's from the OCD or just the lifestyle, but... I see the plant a little bit different. I have an olfactory. I can remember the smells that go with the colors, and it's just a, uh, a numbers, colors, smells type in my mind thing, you know? And I got right now 200 strains out there. We've been very successful with the Murder, She Wrote line. Put out the Murder, She Wrote, which was the bloodbath reversal. It's all over the world. We've done really well with it. Matter of fact, we just put together the Blue Guru Zoo number one. She's got yeah. one. Uh, did you bring seeds? Yes, I did. You got seeds for everybody in here. Everybody gets a pack. <laughs> and that, that place is pretty cool, too. It popped up out of nowhere. She, her place, she's got a Serenity Studios. She's got a beautiful, divine, feminine energy garden. I do a lot of healing there, you know? I heal there. I eat there. I, she takes good care of me there. But that plant popped up out of nowhere there. And it's not any of my genetics. The Guru Soup plant popped up. It's a special plant. So everybody in here will get a pack of the Blue Guru Suit number one. Come on, someone give me a good question. Come on. What's your typical day hour wise? Tip? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> My day is pretty fucking extreme. Like, I, um, I sleep about three, four hours at a time. I do a lot of traveling. There's some things I can't really talk about, like about Chicago and things that I just got out of now. But I grow in three different states. I guess you could call me an underground trap grower if you wanted to. Uh, I mean, we're growing on the south side of Chicago in a fucking brownstone building in a basement. What's that? <laughs> in a brownstone basement in Chicago. And listen, Chicago is lawless. So, you know, you can pretty good. Yeah, it's lawless. And it's about 30% lawless. Where we're at in Chicago, the cops don't come. It's only ran by gangs. Black oh, disciples, BDs. Man. So, yeah. Each other. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, they're, they're shooting. If you drive down the street too fast, they shoot at your vehicle. And shit. So we had to get out of there, dude, because I, you know, I grew up, I grew up back there, but it's too violent, man. Like it rubs off on you. I've had to do a lot of things I can't really talk about um, out of protection. 
And those are things that kind of stay with me, too. I've taken a life over this plant, and I'm not proud of it. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, ma'am. But I have um, just looked at seeing headlines in uh, like Colorado and Oregon that you know the the experiments isn't necessarily going well. I mean, about legalizing it. It's, you know, it's all, it's so broken up and diverse from state to state to state. I mean, look what we're having going on in, you know, with Texas down there and what they're doing. You know, that's just a small thing. Can you imagine if everybody got behind cannabis like that? We could change things overnight, but. So is it, is it, um, are they, um, is it true, those news reports, that things aren't going well as far as, you know, I know what you mean. Yeah, some of them, some of them are. Yeah, it's not a perfect business. There is no, there is no perfect legal market out there. But that's the thing. The wreck is the step, the next step in progression to where things need to be. Because look, if twenty twenty four hits and, and Hawaii doesn't go recreational and Schedule three does hit, they'll kind of be left behind in the cannabis world financially. I guess I'm just not referring to the legalization of it, but the fact that it's happening. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, here's the thing. Look, they say that they say when when the plant goes legal, then there's more crime, right? There's more more money, more problems, right? That's because the plant's fucking illegal. It's not supposed to be illegal. If the plant wasn't illegal, we wouldn't have those problems. The money that's attached to it, the money that's attached to it, it's always going to be attached to it. But I mean, if you close your eyes for a second, what if you woke up tomorrow and it's completely legal? All of it. I mean, it sounds funny, but what if it really was, though? What would that do to the money? The DEA wouldn't have funding. Nobody would be, it would, it would change, it would bring it back to a, just like tomatoes, tomato bush or whatever, whoever has the best tomatoes and grows the best tomatoes would make the most money, artistically. So, we kind of got to get away from the, it's, and here you got to think of this, too, so what happens if we go to war? You know, we have a World War III kickoff. Now, already some other countries are legalizing cannabis right now for war reasons. That's another potential that could happen. 2027, I love all countries, so I'm not... If we went to war with China or something, let's say, what if they had to legalize cannabis like that? There are many things unforeseen that, that could happen as well. That's why this Schedule Three that they're doing... I know everyone has their own opinion on everything in the business, but I do feel I have a, a broad scope of it over time, since 2005. But yeah, a lot of that stuff is true. Those places get robbed and people, yeah. They have, like stuff out in New York and things like that too. Yeah, the plant shouldn't be illegal like that though, in my opinion. Are there any states that have like recreational but it's regulated, you know, by the government? You know, I mean, they have their, I don't know, kind of like testing or whatever to make sure that everything's up okay. I mean, it's kind of really hard to say. Dude, what they did is they modeled after model. You know, I mean, there were some first ones to go. A lot of them started modeling it after Colorado, these other states that went. It's modeled after a bad model that went bad. How can we keep modeling shit after we can look back at a bad model, but we model it after it again? Why are we doing this with this plant that we all love and is a medicine that takes care of each one of us? My buddy's retired military. Why do we got soldiers worrying about growing plants in their backyard that fought for this country? I can't believe that. Like, it's just, it blows my mind. And all this is because the money that's behind it, too. You know, you take the money out of it, now what happens to the crime? Now you know we out robbing each other over tomato plants and stuff like that right now, you know? So when we can take those aspects out, the greed, when we can take the man-made greed out of it, then we can take it to a new level. We really can as humans together. And I understand everyone wants the clout and the ego and their picture up on their fucking soil bag and everything. I know they do. But those are the people that are killing the culture too by ostracizing and trying to take their buddies around that don't nobody want to see no way. We need to fill this culture with fresh breath. We fill this cultural lungs with new people. I also want to say thank you to you out there, man, for putting this together for giving us an opportunity and treating us fair. We don't get treated fair everywhere we go. People think I'm crazy, you know, 
But I'm very humbly thank you for putting a beautiful event together and allowing us all to come out. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, there is no perfect market out there, dude. There's really not. But what we can do is we can get behind each other and we can start letting people know that this is one plant. These people wrote all these laws, THCC, THCA, all this fucking dirt. Dude, stop. Stop with it. Stop breaking it down. Stop. Just bring it back to the origin of what it is, which is a plant. It's medicine. It's been around for a long time. It's going to be around for a long time after us. It's a spirit. It's an entity and a spirit. And it's been around for a long time. And we haven't treated it right. It's a feminine energy. The plant is a divine feminine energy. We smoke the female flower. It's a female energy. We need to treat her right. I think it might be the knowledge of it. Could be. It could be. It's powerful, no matter what it is. Yeah. It really is. But we need to take it back to those origins. I know everybody want to make money and all these craft farms, you know, they wanted to get rich, you know, all these different craft farms, and they didn't. I'm sorry, you didn't get rich off the plant, okay, you know, your farm's done, we understand you love the plant, you love weed, your farm didn't work out, and, um, and nobody really getting rich off this plant, man, I mean, super, super, like, come on, you know, people need to stop with it. But I think if we get behind each other and put that focus on it, we'll get a lot farther. Question? Yes, ma'am? Has anybody approached you to do a documentary? <clears throat> no, nobody has, truthfully. As a matter of fact, if you want to know the truth, I've never done a major podcast. I've never been on a fucking cover of a magazine. I've None of that. I've only been a judge for a competition one time. I haven't really got no show, no love in the industry like that because I'm an underground black market dude. I mean, they like to say I'm the underground black market king, humbly. <laughs> but uh, no, I thank you for asking that question, too. No, nobody ever has. I talked with uh, Soft White Underbelly off YouTube a couple times, but, you know, I'm glad kind of we haven't either, because all this story is still evolving and carrying. I'm glad I didn't 10 years ago start telling my story about up to that point, because it's still continuing to go on, and it's getting better. It's getting better and better. I'm very thankful to Guru Sue over there and her energy work that she does. That stuff is real. The crystals and the oils and all that. She, you know, like, I didn't know nothing about that, man, but it worked. Like, <laughs> yeah. I've been trying to be a better guy these days. You know, I've been trying to be a better man in this world. I'm a bad guy with a good heart. Justin, I wanted to say Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I find a gratification in you know myself. I enjoy like I enjoy seeing everybody come together and have a good time. That's what this plan is about, man. It's about smoking. It's about teaching. It's about bringing our kids around it. Like, how do you want to keep your kid away from it and hide it from them and hide it and they're going to end up into it anyway? You know, like. Be honest with them. You know, if they're going to smoke pot for their first time, let it be with you. You know, what I mean? you know what I mean? So you can control how much dose. You don't want them fucking taking a 100 milligram something and driving one. That Let them know about this plan, man. Teach them correctly. We come up here for saying, Tristan. I've always been honest, open with this kid right here. I just wanted you to come up. This is my daughter right here. I'm a fifth generation farmer, <laughs> so she'd be a sixth generation man. So yeah, man, I'm grateful to be able to come. Never even told my to come up. I've never even talked like this before ever in my life. This is my first time. I'm not nervous at all because it's all true and it's all honest. <laughs> I mean, I don't got never be nervous about it. It's really my life, like. So, thank you guys for coming in here and listening to me and taking the time to come in here. Um, I hope you hope you come back next year. We'd love to come back next year as well. And um, if there isn't any other questions, I can wrap it up with that. Unless there's any other questions, I'd love to answer.
That's it. Right on. Okay. Okay.